Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios, your source for pottery information. I'm Phil Bernberg. Today, today's topic is an introduction to glaze testing, and we're going to be really talking about, uh, it, as a general introduction, but also talking about a specific example of how you could conduct a particular kind of test. So we're going to be exploring a simple glaze recipe to demonstrate the effects and the functions of the different ingredients in the glaze. This was actually based on a workshop that we conducted here at Washington Street Studios. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. So for this particular exercise, the general procedure is we're going to take a recipe for a base glaze with four ingredients, and then one at a time we're going to double the percentage of each one of the ingredients. So we'll, ha we'll end up with five glaze batches. We'll have the original recipe, and then we'll have a batch with the first ingredient doubled, and then the second, and the third, and the fifth, and so forth. And what we're doing when we do that is when we double each ingredient one at a time, we're going to keep the remaining ingredients in the same proportions. They will, the, the total amount will decrease, of course, but the proportions among the remaining ingredients will remain the same. And the, the goal of this experiment is to see the effect of increasing each ingredient. It'll tell us something about what that ingredient contributes to the functioning of the glaze. I want to step back a little bit at this point and just talk, generalize now a little bit about glaze testing and just talk about some of the, the, the different goals that you can have for testing glazes. One of the goals can be just to evaluate a glaze recipe that you might find online or in a book or from a friend, but using your materials and your firing conditions because your materials, your source of your raw materials might be different than somebody else. For instance, you might have a slightly different soda feldspar than somebody else. And nobody fires exactly the same, and no two kilns are exactly the same. So an important part of testing a glaze can just be to see how, do, how does that glaze perform under your conditions with your materials. That's, that's one, one goal for, for testing. Another one might be to find the best percentage for an ingredient such as a colorant. Since everybody's tastes are different, you might have a certain base glaze, and maybe let's say, for example, it's a green glaze, and you're going to add a colorant to it, such as copper carbonate, but you want to find out for your own particular taste or your own needs, what's the best level? So you might do a glaze test series where you vary the amount of the colorant to find out what gives you the best color. That would be another, another goal for a glaze test. Another one might be to test a substitute ingredient. For instance, a lot of recipes call for materials that are no longer available, like Kingman feldspar or some of the material which has been mined out, and yet the recipes are still out there. And so, for instance, you might have to substitute, let's say, a different source of potash feldspar for the one that was quoted in the book or in the, in the recipe. So in that case, you'd want to run the test just to see what happens if I substitute this new ingredient, how does the glaze perform? Um, another, another goal or, or ob objective for glaze testing can be to understand the functions of an ingredient or the ingredients. And that's, that's what applies to this particular example we'll be talking about. We're doing this, this experiment or this test to try to understand what are these ingredients can, contributing to the glaze. Um, another, another, there, then there, there's another whole, there are other things you can do or reasons for doing a glaze test. You might want to change a glaze property, for instance, to solve a problem. So you might want to change the firing temperature a little bit. You might, maybe the glaze is runny, so you want to correct or fix, maybe, or maybe you want the glaze to be a little runnier. So you might want to, you might want to make that adjustment. Um, maybe you have a crazing or a shivering problem with the glaze, so that's a problem you need to solve, and you could do that with glaze testing by modifying the composition of the glaze. You might want to change the color of the glaze, for example, modify it, as I mentioned, and you also might even want to change the surface texture. Maybe, maybe you're, for instance, you're, you have a matte glaze, and you want it to make a little more satiny, not quite so dry, so you could run a series of tests to do that. You also, another, as you can see so far going down this list, there are a lot of different reasons for doing glaze testing. Um, another one is you might want to create a completely new glaze recipe. You might, you might just want to say, okay, I just want to, I want to understand more about glazes. What happens if I take these materials as raw materials 
And can I develop a glaze using those? A, a maybe a, a really unique formula that you've developed yourself. Um, and finally, um, you might want to develop a glaze using a new ingredient. For instance, you might have, let's say, a fairly common thing might be for you to have a local clay or a local mineral that's available where you live. And you might say, you know, wouldn't this be great if I could develop a glaze and, and have this connection to this local source, develop a glaze using this local clay or incorporating this local material. And again, that would be a different type or a different approach to glaze testing. There are different types of glaze test samples out there also that, that give you different information. And I've got some examples over here on the sideboard that we can take a look at. Um, well, there we go. Um, first of all, you can do flat tiles or like this, which th this is what I'll be talking about here, which was just cut out of a, of, a, of a sheet of clay. You can actually use just shards of clay. I'll sometimes just break, if I'm, if I'm not doing something that, that requires the same surface every time, I'll just break up an old bisqueware pot and, and use the shards for testing. You can also, an, another added feature that you can incorporate with that is also is texture the shards. So I can see how the, the, the glaze might break or not or be affected by the texture. In this case, I've also, I've, I've, I've bent the sample because in this case, I can stand this, this sample up now. And so instead of just lying flat, I can see how the glaze perform in a vertical position and see how much the glaze runs down the texture. So I've got the combined effect of gravity and the texture. And then this is another just example where I've turned it into a tube and, um, and I can stand it up. And what I did here was I put different textures on different sides of the sample. So on this one sample, I can, I can try different textures and still have it in a vertical position. Um, another, another approach to, to glaze test samples could be um, like segments. I've, I've, I make these a lot. This is a thrown segment, part of a ring segment that I've thrown. But I can also, this, this particular one, I've, I've done the same geometry, but I've hand built it instead so that it can still stand up. But I just made it out of pieces of a slab rather than, th rather than throwing it. And the nice, and this is an example of one of, these, the, one of these thrown ring segment sections. The nice thing is I can incorporate texture on it. I can also, with this one, I can actually incorporate a slip on the back side. So I can get lots of different, lots of information from the one sample. I can get the, the original clay color, the glaze over a slip or an on gobe or an underglaze, and I can also see the effect of texture all in one sample. And I can, the nice thing also that I like about this particular form is by having that foot it catches most of the glaze drips. So unless the glaze is really runny, it will catch most of the drips. As you, and you can see on this particular one, the glaze has flowed quite a bit, but it caught, it caught the extra glaze. In the case of like, maybe when you're starting out with really unknown compositions, then it's a good idea to use a test cup like this, because then you can, you can mix the ingredients in it, put the ingredients in it, and melt it. But you, that way, in case it really runs, you can catch them. And I like the cup also because when you, put, when you first put the wet glaze in it, if you roll the glaze around and then let it sit, you can get a variation in thickness. You can get a thin coating of the glaze high on the walls, and then you can get sort of a puddle in the bottom. So you can get quite a range in thickness of the glaze, again, to see how that affects it. And lastly, I, the example I've got here, this is an extruded section. And the, the thing I like about ex making extruded pieces and then just cutting them is you can crank out a large quantity of samples very easily. Um, and this has a hole in it so it could be hung on a display board. But the other thing I found these very useful for are, is for atmospheric firings because by having, when I stand it up in the, in the kiln in, like this, the inside is basically pretty much protected from soda in the case of a soda firing or from wood ash. So I have exposed surfaces that face the direction of the flow. I have surfaces on the back sample that are shielded from the flow. And then I have surfaces inside that are basically, that aren't gonna receive, receive little or no ash. Plus it takes up, it doesn't take up much room in the kiln. So I found this is a very handy, I've used these, this style of sample a lot for atmospheric firings, very, ha very uh, handy size. Um, okay, so let's talk about the, the particular experiment we're, 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 we're describing here. And, and I guess let's look at the, what, and this, so th this, this is the recipe. This is the base recipe that I chose for this particular experiment. And I purposely picked this recipe because 
there is not a huge range in the percentage of the raw materials. I didn't want to have one raw material be very low or very high and then I'm trying to double it. I wanted them to be more or less balanced to begin with so that I could see the effects more easily. So this, is, this was taken from the book Amazing Glaze by Gabriel Klein and it's a, it was listed as the base glaze for charcoal satin. Now this, since this is the base glaze, we don't have any colorants or opacifiers in it. So this is just going to be a clear or colorless or possibly white glaze by itself. So we've got, we've got and I wanted four ingredients because I wanted to keep it simple. So we've got EPK, Edgar Plastic Kaolin, 31.7%, percent ferro 31.24, 31%, elastinite, 23.2%, and silica, 14.1% for 100%. And what I'm also showing here is when we did this experiment, we, we made up 300 gram batches because, and I'll explain this a little bit later, we wanted to use these batches for some subsequent testing. There's going to be a part two to this discussion on this, on this, um, this glaze test where we're gonna do further testing, another, another step or another series. And so I wanted to have enough of the glaze left over that we could do those modifications and continue the testing on the same batches. So that's why we're showing the weights for the 300 grams. So what we have here is, from, here's the recipe now where I've doubled, so I'm going to go down the list of ingredients and then one at a time produce a batch of glaze with one of the ingredients doubled. So here's the double EPK. Instead of having 31.7%, I've got 63.4%. And then I adjusted all the other compositions. These three, the remaining ingredients are still in the same proportion among them that they were here. Just the total is less because I've, I've increased the amount of EPK. So here's the formula for the double EPK. Then we go over to the 3124. Up here I had 31%, so down here I've got 62%. And then again, the others are kept in the same proportions and the 300 grams. And could we go to the next, the next view then? Okay, and then here's the double, this is the double wollastonite. Again, wollastonite was 23.2, and now it's 46.4, and I've doubled everything else. And finally, here's the double silica batch. Silica was 14.1, now it's 28.2. And so there are five batches. We have the original batch, and now we have these four batches, each of which has a double percentage in it. By the way, just at this point, just to mention, you may, be, in taste, you may or may not be familiar with the ingredients. EPK, that's Edgar Plastic Kaolin. That's a kind of kaolin clay. Ferrofrit 3124, that's a frit, and it's a calcium boron sodium aluminum silicate and it melts at around 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a relatively low melting frit, basically. And it's, it's in there as, as, a, as a flux. Well, astonite is a calcium silicate, <coughs> excuse me, and, and of course silica. Okay, so the steps in this, in this procedure where we made up the test specimens, first of all, we made up text, test specimens. In this case, I was using these small, these small um, coupon sort of size uh, pieces that I used. And, and we waxed them, just to make it easier, we waxed the edges and we backed the back sides so that we could dip them in the samples and not have to do a whole lot of cleaning on the back sides. These were going to be fired flat. Then we made up the five gram, the five glazed batches. We made up 300 gram batches. In general, if you're not going to do this sequence of testing that I'm describing on the same samples, I found that 100 or 200 gram batches are more than adequate for most samples like this. In this case, we wanted it to be a little larger. We mix the samples well. And this is a case where I really recommend if you have some kind of an immersion mixer, a kitchen mixer like this, this, excuse me, this does a great job of mixing. Because we made, we made up our samples in these sort of quart size yogurt containers, about a quart size thing. And this fits very nicely down into it and does a beautiful job on mixing. It breaks up a lot of lumps. And so this, I really recommend this, um, as this is a great tool or something like this, an immersion mixer. To, uh, to do the mixing. And then if necessary, if you have to screen them, if you're still worried about lumps, I've never had a problem with, going, with worrying about going to really fine screening. In most cases, I've found just a tea strainer like this is adequate. This is a fairly fine mesh, but it's just an ordinary tea strainer that I bought in a kitchen goods store. And this is fine just to sort of run it through to make sure I didn't pick up any paper fibers or any contamination at the last minute. So that worked great. So then we dipped the samples in these, in these five batches and then we, um, and then we, and then we, and then we fired them to cone six, 
and then and then we and then and then and then looked at them. But before we actually, let's we're going to look at the results. But before we do, what I'd like to do is digress again a little bit. I love these digressions. What we're going to do again a little bit is we're going to talk a little bit about glazes in general. Just I don't know how familiar everybody is with what glazes are. So we're going to back up and talk a little bit of background so that I think we'll be able to understand the results a little better when we talk about those. So to start at the obvious, what is a glaze? Well, a glaze is a glass coating. It's actually a coating of glass. And the difference between a glass and most other materials is that the atoms in it are randomly arranged. They're not in an orderly pattern. And one of the biggest consequences of that is that glasses don't have, a, in most cases, don't have a definite melting point. When you think about something like ice, which is crystalline, when you get to a certain temperature, boom, it melts and it goes from solid to liquid. Glasses in general don't do that. As you get, as you get higher and higher temperature, they get softer and softer and softer. And then they finally maybe get soft enough where they can kind of move a little bit and then they can flow. But they don't have a, they don't have a specific temperature where all of a sudden they go from solid to liquid. And that's a big difference from the way most materials melt. But that's one of the consequences of a glass and the fact the way the atoms are arranged. So we make, we make the glaze by combining, in, so basically we, melt, we make a glaze by combining ingredients that melt all together. And then when they, they, and they cool and solidify, they form a glass. Instead of crystallizing, they tend to form a glass. The atoms stay randomly arranged. Our glasses, the glazes that we use for pottery are made primarily from silica. The bulk of them is silica. But silica melts at a really high temperature, generally over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which we can't reach with our kilns. So we add other ingredients to the silica to make the combination melt at a lower temperature. And these other ingredients that we melt, that we add, are called fluxes. They help the silica, the combination of the silica and the flux melt at a lower temperature that's within the firing range of our kilns. And then we also add stabilizers to them to uh, primarily to to control the running so that when they melt they don't turn into something like water they turn into something more like honey that will flow and move slowly and not just run off all the pots and that terminology the fluxes stabilizes in glass formers or glass that comes from the Seeger formula in case you're, you're familiar with that. that's the Seeger notation or the way of describing a glaze so we end up with a gla glazes being composed of a glass former fluxes and stabilizers. And these are all, we, in, in general, when we're discussing them, we talk about them in terms of the chemical oxides. So we say like silica, which is silicon dioxide, or aluminum oxide, or fluxes like sodium oxide or calcium oxide. That's just the standard terminology. So, but we don't actually, when we're making up a glaze, we're not actually weighing out individual oxides. We use ingredients, as you're probably aware, that combine or contain the, the oxides that we want. So silica, we're lucky. Silica is pure silicon dioxide. That's one of the, the few ones that what we're weighing is what we want. But for instance, fritz, pow these powdered glasses, are a combination of the different oxides. Like I mentioned that the 3124 is, contains calcium oxide and boron oxide and sodium oxide and aluminum oxide. So it, it contains the ingredients we want, but it's not just one single ingredient. In the same way also, a lot of our ingredients for glazes are either powdered rocks or powdered minerals. Like they might be clay. For instance, the feldspars is a good example. The whole family, the soda feldspars and potash feldspars, those contain like sodium oxide, or potassium oxide, and also aluminum oxide, and also silica. So they're, com they're combination ingredients. So we're using these ingredients that are like mixtures of the things we actually want. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And consider becoming a patron of our channel. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. If you would like more information about our membership studio, classes, events, and multimedia productions at Washington Street Studios, visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Okay, one, one or two other just part a little notes here is that I think we've, we've mentioned this before in some of our previous discussions that the proper way or the best way to express a glaze recipe is, is to have the ingredients listed as a base glaze such as this. That's the, those are the materials that are forming the bulk of the glass. 
And then any modifiers or additives like colorants or opacifiers or little things that you're putting in to sort of tweak the glaze come after that. So you'd have the base glaze and then you'd have plus the modifiers. Like so the, down here, if I had a color in here, I'd have this and then down here I'd say plus, for example, iron oxide 3% or something like that. And the reason why is because the, when you, it, it's easier if you're looking at a glaze recipe, it's easier to compare it to other recipes if it's written as a base formula because that's what's controlling most of the glaze properties. In general, these little modifiers like adding a little bit of colorant don't affect the way the glaze melts or the temperature that it fires at. So it's nice to be able to look at two recipes and say, well, yeah, those percentages are fairly similar, so they probably behave in a similar manner. And it's harder to do that if all of these other ingredients are added in because it affects the, the, the percentage numbers. Finally, also, sometimes you'll see recipes, along with these lines of the format, you'll see recipes written in parts, which means that when you look at the amounts or the, the, the quantities given, they don't add up to 100%. It might be less than 100%. It might be greater than 100%. Um, but the, so I'm calling that parts and it could be parts by weight it might be just weights and it might be the total of the weights might be 1650 something or others and that's okay but if you can it's still u very useful to convert it to, per to weight percent and another another form that I've seen for parts is by volumes they'll say you know like a cup of this two tablespoons full of that and a cup of this. That's a really bad way to give a recipe because different materials from different sources don't have the same weight all the time for the same volume. So for, in for, in for instance, even though ball clay, let's say, and EPK might be fairly similar in composition, a cup of EPK is probably going to be lighter in weight, for example, than a cup of ball clay. So you, the, if you really want to, chemistry, you really want to do it by weight, not by volumes. Okay. So, just to, to, to talk, just to reinforce what I just talked about with our recipe here, if we look at our recipe over here, we had EPK, 3124, elastinite, and silica. So the EPK is providing a stabilizer. This is where I'm talking about the combined ingredients. It's providing a stabilizer because it contains aluminum oxide. This is the formula for aluminum oxide. And it also contains some silica. The, the 3124 frit actually it's providing a flux or several fluxes to the glaze. It's providing calcium oxide, boron oxide, and sodium oxide, and it's also providing a little bit of stabilizer, alumina, and a whole lot of silica. The wollastonite, is, that's, that's a naturally occurring mineral. It's a calcium silicate. So again, it's providing some flux, in this case, calcium oxide, and it's also providing some silica. And finally, we have the silica. So the first three ingredients are providing more than just one of these sort of essential components that we need for the glaze. OK, so let's look at, I'm going to move these samples that I have on here and put these samples, move these off. And I'll put these sample, the sample tiles so that you can see them. And we'll talk about them. What did we get when we did the, when we did the firings? And I'll try to break these samples as I move them here. I'm going to hold them up to the camera to get a little closer um, view, but I'm just going to talk about them and then I'll hold them up to see. These are going to be a little difficult to see, I admit it, because they have no color in most cases. They're just, they're either white or they're clear. So in this case, but a lot of, a lot of the results really have to do with the texture of them. Um, and so, and so let's talk about them. So this first sample here, this is, this is the original, I'm going to hold it up to the camera. This is the original recipe. And if, if I tilt it a little bit so the light reflects off it, you may be able to see it. It's a, it's a nice sort of semi-clear translucent satin glaze. This came out uh, a really nice, this pretty much exactly the way the recipe claimed that it should, which is for me is unusual. Um, but it's a nice sort of semi-clear satin um, glaze. So uh, that's, that's, our, that's our basis of comparison, okay? So now we, have, now we go to the recipes where, the recipe where we double the ingredients. So this, this next one here, this is where we doubled the EPK. Okay, and as you can see, it's not even, it's not shiny and it's not clear. And basically what happens is we overloaded the glaze with the clay, is that it couldn't all melt. All the clay couldn't even be absorbed in the, in the glaze. So basically we have a whole lot of clay floating around in the glaze, so much so that it just made it opaque and actually chalky looking. It's dull, it's completely matte, it's kind of chalky. It would mark with metal, you know, it, it would metal mark really badly because it's a, sort of a rough surface. Complete, so, so doubling the EPK changed it a lot. 
we, it basically, we overstabilized the glade. We put in so much stabilizer that it couldn't even melt, okay? The next one was double, that's this one, is double 3124. That's double the frit. And if I hold it up to you so you can, and I tilt it, you can see it so the light reflects on it. It's very glassy looking and it's, it's almost completely clear. It's a little milky, but it's very glassy and it also flowed a little bit. Well, you'd expect that actually if, if, because the 3124 is a, is a low melting frit. So if I add something to the glaze that tends to want to melt at a lot lower temperature, it's gonna make the whole glaze more fluid and more molten. So that's exactly what it is. So this is consistent with what I would expect to see by increasing the frit. Okay, and there, one thing I guess I want to mention also at this point, which is really kind of interesting, I really think it's worthwhile if you're interested in glazes to get a small hand lens or hand magnifier like this. This is a 10 power magnifier because there's a lot, if you're really interested in glaze testing, there's a lot you can learn by looking at the samples under a magnifying glass. And this is a perfect example because Looking at this with the naked eye, this 3124 sample, all you can see is that it's, it's very glossy and it looks a little translucent. It's not, not water clear. And you might say, well, why isn't it water clear? Well, if you look at it with the magnifying glass, the reason why you can see it's loaded with bubbles. There are air bubbles in it. It's just full of air bubbles that you can easily see with the magnifying glass. And that's true for, when you look at, when I've looked at all of these samples, you can see a lot of the detail that you can't see with the naked eye that explains why they are the way they are, why, they, why they, they work the way they did. So in this case, the minute I looked at this with the magnifying glass, you can see that it's loaded with bubbles. The glass itself is nice and clear, but the bubbles, the trapped bubbles, give it this overall slightly milky appearance. So it's nice to be, because then you can say, well, okay, I understand what happened. You know, and part of, the, I think, the reason why that was because this melted so quickly that the air that was trapped in the dried glaze couldn't get out and couldn't escape. Okay, so the next one we have is double the wellastonite, and that's this one. And again, this is kind of set, this one looks very similar to the starting, to the starting recipe. Um, it's kind of a satiny, a satiny finish, the one difference is that whereas the original recipe, even on the textured portion, had the same texture and the same appearance of the glaze over the top of the bumps and down in the valleys, this one is a little different. In this case, the top, and I know, I know you probably can't see it in this sample, but the tops of the valleys are actually shiny and they look a little different than the puddles down in the bottom. And that's because we changed the, the chemistry of the glaze enough so that when it melted, we actually had more crystals forming because the last night tends to form crystals in the glaze when it cools, which is what makes it satiny. But we also formed a runnier melt. So we had, so it was sort of like mush. We ended up forming crystals and then a liquid that was actually more runny that was left. So it flowed and changed, the, and so it, it sort of broke over the surface, but instead of changing or breaking in color, it broke in texture. So that in the, where it puddled, it was more matte, and where it was, could break on the edges, it was shinier. Now that's, that could be a nice characteristic to use if you added a color into it, because it would change, you might have like, you'd have a contrast between a slightly different color or slightly different texture and, and texture at the same time, which could be a really nice effect over texture. And then finally, the last one we had was double silica. And double silica, basically, what happened was when we added so much silica, it still came out shiny, but it, it, was, it wasn't very fluid at all because basically we overpowered the fluxes. We had so much more, because remember the silica is helping, the fluxes are helping the silica melt. Well, in this case, we added so much more silica that the fluxes couldn't effectively melt it. So there's probably some, some unmelted silica, little particles that are suspended in the glaze, the same way the EPK was suspended in the glaze. It all couldn't melt, but we just overloaded the, we overloaded the, uh, the fluxes. So one thing, one thing, to, uh, the one thing that was nice about this is, all of these results, if you understand the glazing ingredients, were completely consistent with what you'd expect based on what we did. There, was nothing, there weren't any surprises here like, oh, you know, something weird happened. This is what you would expect to happen. But if you didn't, this is an, again, this is a nice way to sort of understand, you know, what was happening. What did these, what did these ingredients do um, to the glaze? So I guess in conclusion, a couple of conclusions we can draw from this is that, first of all, this was a base glaze. So there was no color. The only, if you want to call white a color, the only change we got really in the appearance of it was the fact that when we added so much EPK, it completely made it opaque white. That's the, that, that. the other thing is that I thought was very interesting in this case, 
which was nice to see. The original recipe came out actually as intended, surprise, surprise, um, that, that it was supposed to be this nice satin glaze, and it was, and it fired very nicely at cone six. Um, it wasn't overfired, over, it wasn't underfired, so that was, that was nice to see. Um, and the other thing that I think is kind of interesting is that, except possibly for the double EPK, these were all usable glazes. They may not be, you know, like, like the, and the EPK could still be used, for instance, on sculpture or something, although you know, I think it would tend to get dirty by handling it because it's so rough and porous. But all of the other three, the double silica, double willastonite, and double frit, were usable glazes. They just had slightly different characteristics than the original recipe. So they're not bad, they're just different, okay? Um, and as I mentioned before, that the changes that we got basically were consistent with what, with what in this case, what I would expect from these, from, these, from these particular changes that we made. I wanted to mention, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, so what we're going to do is the, we're going to continue this, this discussion of this, this test series in part two of this discussion. Um, and when that will be presented another time, probably next month. And what we're going to be doing there is we're going to be adding colorants and opacifiers to them at different levels to see the effect of superimposing the colorant on top of these different compositional changes, what happens. And then we'll talk also a little bit more at that time about what steps, what are, you know, and if you do a glaze testing like this, there are, there are ser you can do these, these tests in series like we're going to demonstrate here. And so what are some of the possible series of steps that you can do when you're, when you're doing this kind of testing? Well, I hope this is, we hope that this discussion has been useful today. We know this was a lot of information in a fairly short period of time. So if you'd like to hear it again, you can listen to our podcast um, and, and, and search for the Potter's Roundtable on our podcast platform. And I see that we may have a question or a comment. Yeah, Phil, there was a question that says, how would you overcome bloating and pitting uh, during firing of old sanitary wear in production? Well, bloating, if you're talking about true bloating, bloating is a characteristic of the clay. So bloating, and if it's sanitary wear, that probably means it was white wear or white clay. And the only time I've seen white clay bloat is when it's overfired. It's when it's fired, it's too high a temperature or too quickly. But bloating is where the, the clay actually, I think we can do this on the board, where actually gas is, tr gas is coming off from the clay. The clay is melting and the clay is getting soft. And so you have gas coming off, you have gas coming off from the clay and it actually makes the clay rise almost the same way the dough rises. So that if you look at the surface of the clay and you end up with this sort of bump and, it, and, it, and in some cases, the bump might go through to both sides. This is like the wall of the pot. If you looked in here, this would actually look like, like the inside of a, of a muffin or the inside of a biscuit. You'd actually have it, it's kind of stringy, where the clay is actually expanded just the same way dough rises. And that's because something melted in here and gave off gas during the firing. And when the clay softened, the, the gas expanded and actually sort of blew up the clay. Now the other part of it, what was the other part, Dennis? It was blistering. Bloating and let me pitting. Pitting, it it would depend. There are there are lots of different kinds of pits. Um, if if it was on the same material, if it was old whiteware, again the bloating to me would indicate over firing. And if it's pitting, then it might have been cratering. If it was glaze, where what happens is the glaze actually the the glaze actually uh, melts and it actually bo you can boil the glaze and then when then when the bubble so you actually if here's the clay. And you can actually form like bubbles in the glaze. And then when the glaze, when the bubble pops, you end up with these rims or what could look like pits in the surface from the pop bubbles. That's a part, and that would be consistent with this, is that some of the glazes, especially if this is, if, I don't, is this, we don't know, I don't, I don't know whether this is cone six or what the firing temperature was. But if it's, if, especially if it's cone six or lower, um, it's possible to, it's possible to actually cause some of the glazes to sort of boil and you cook off gases. So the clay is bloating and the glaze is, is giving off some gas as well. And you end up with pop bubbles that can look like pits in the surface. Do we have another question? Uh, nope, that's okay. all the questions all right. we have so far. So I mentioned anyway about the podcast. If you enjoyed the presentation, please like it and subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends. This helps our, our videos get found by other people. Um, and if you didn't like it, tell us why. Maybe we can do better next time. Also, check out our website, www.hfclay.com. Um, 
As I mentioned, the next topic, the follow-on topic to this one, will be a continuation of the same discussion where we'll take these same five compositions and we'll add some colorants and opacifiers to them for particular reasons that we'll discuss. The choice of the colorant will depend on what the, what the recipe was. And we'll talk again more about the results um, and, and you know, how they turn out. Yeah, I mentioned a couple of times during the presentation that this was a cone six glaze. And as I say, the thing I was very pleased about was the fact that I've mentioned this before in some of the other presentations that we made. There are a lot of bad recipes out there, bad for one reason or another. And a lot of them is they just, you know, you'll, you'll see a recipe or maybe you'll see a picture and you'll test it and it doesn't come out anything like what the picture is or what, it's, what the glaze is supposed to come out. That's not surprising because there are a lot of recipes that are just faulty out there. Either they would, I've seen some recipes that there's no way in the world they could work. They just simply can't work. So the nice thing was, that I picked this one as I mentioned because it's a, it's a simple recipe. That's, it. That's another really, I think, important point to make about glaze recipes. They don't have to be complicated. You can make a glaze in some cases, for example, some, if, if I was firing at low temperature, some of these frits are in fact a glaze. I mentioned over here, which I've now erased so it's gone so you can't see it, but this particular frit is calcium boron sodium aluminum silicate. That has all the ingredients in it by itself to be a glaze. It has several fluxes, it has alumina and silica. And so there are quite a few of these low temperature frits that all by themselves, they are a base glaze. So there's a case where you have a one ingredient glaze. But it's very easy to formulate glazes with two ingredients or three or four. You don't need 15 ingredients to have a, to have a, a, good, a successful glaze. And as a matter of fact, when I see a recipe that has a whole, that has 15 rest, uh, ingredients, I'm a little suspicious. Because it, to me, it means that somebody has been tinkering with a formula. And I often wonder, you know, what would happen? Matter of fact, this is the, if you, if you really like doing this sort of experimentation, this is a fun thing to try. Take a recipe that has 15 ingredients and remove one of the ingredients, especially if it's like less than 10% and see what happens. I wouldn't be surprised if you couldn't see the difference in the results when you pull that recipe out. Because I've seen a lot of cases where people tinker with a recipe and they change it a little bit and they don't necessarily do a controlled experiment, for instance, they don't necessarily make the change and compare it side by side with a piece that where they haven't changed the recipe. So they go, oh, look at the results I got. It must be because I did this. Well, it might in fact be because the kiln cooled slower or because it was closer to the elements or because it got a little hotter or it heated a little longer. So a lot of times reports that I've seen on modifications to glazes were not in fact due to the change they made to the glaze. They were due to, the, to some other change that happened either intentionally or inadvertently in firing the glaze. So the real point is you don't need complicated recipes to, to make a, a good glaze. And this is a perfect example. This is a really simple recipe and it's a really nice glaze fired exactly the way it was supposed to. Okay. So there was one more question. Okay, are we still, we're still on? on? We're still on. Okay, good. And this was, I'm almost ready to buy a kiln, but my building is only wired to 25 amps and road 60L that can accommodate, will only fire to 1200 degrees centigrade. Is this a huge barrier? Ash glazes won't really melt, right? That's true. Ash glazes in general won't melt, but you can, it doesn't mean that you can't, you can, I mean, you could certainly do, for instance, earthenware um, glazes at that. And you can buy, and you can actually, you can buy small, if you're not in production, especially if it's learning or small pieces, you can buy these small test kilns that will go to cone 10 on 110 volts. We have one in the studio here. Um, and, it, I, and I have one in my studio at home and it, it actually, work, it just works off of 20 amp service, um, a normal, normal outlet. Um, but it'll actually go to cone 10 and I can put a couple of mugs in it or a couple of small pieces. But yeah, ash glazes, you can, you can, you can use, you can make up a glaze recipe, for example, where you could put some ash in it um, and, with other, with, and if you added enough fluxes, you could get it to melt at a lot lower temperature than cone 10. But a lot of the ash glazes um, are highly dependent on the, you know, there's a lot of ash in them and they need the higher temperatures to melt. And the wood ash by itself, of course, needs, when it reacts with the clay, needs cone 10 or higher to, to really to melt significantly. Well, we really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts. And if you'd like to help us, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. We have five options, five different patronage levels that you could subscribe to. And we decided instead of naming them the typical gold, silver, bronze, platinum, we decided to give them clay names. So 
the first, the first level we have is, is what we're calling a clay patron, and that's for a dollar a month. And in, in exchange, you get recognition on our patron appreciation page in, our, in all of our videos. The second level that we have, we're calling a bisque level, which is um, $5 a month. And again, you get the recognition, plus you get a Potter's Roundtable sticker that you can put on your laptop or wherever you like, or on your forehead. Um, looks like this. Um, the third level that we have is called the earthenware level. That's $10 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get a transcript of any available episode that we have every month, a transcript of the, of the, of the presentations. The, the stoneware level is the next one. That's for $20 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get one of our Potter's Roundtable t-shirts that looks like this. And the final level that we have is what we're calling the porcelain patron level, which is for $50 a month. And again, you get all the previous benefits. You also get a handmade by, our, by Dennis, our, our, one of our founding members here, a handmade uh, pot, Potter's Roundtable mug. Well, thank you very much again for visiting with us today. We hope we see you next time when we continue this discussion of this glaze testing. By the way, I should mention also that we're planning on doing other types of glaze testing discussions in the future. One of the, one of the topics we'd like to talk about is the use of triaxial and quadraxial blends, which is a testing approach to, to looking at these materials. And we're going to be doing one talking about quadraxial blends, for instance, how you, if you had four materials, how you could evaluate and find out where are the compositions of those four, or the combinations of those four materials that would yield a useful glaze? And that's, that's, that's another topic we're planning for the, for the not too distant future. So thank you again for joining us today. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.